السلام عليكم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين In order to build a good, righteous, happy and successful society Islam focuses on building the character of each individual within the society first then puts its emphasis on what we call the institution of family which is the cornerstone of each society. The institution of family starts with the marriage between men and women within the society. This is why we can say that Islam is the religion of marriage and only allows divorce as a last resort and in order to create better marriages after each divorce. <coughs> Today we will discuss the marriage and divorce in Islam, the rights and roles of husbands and wives, and the implications according to the Quran and Sunnah. And in between we will explain verse uh, 34 in chapter 4. There are many related verses we will bring as evidence, some of which we just mention or give the reference but not go into detail so we can finish this topic in one session inshallah. My recommendation would be to listen to this session all in one sitting, all at once, uh, with the Quran open so you can go through these verses that we give the address to. The Quran encourages marriage in many ways and makes it the only avenue for satisfying the sexual instinct. It urges society to bring about the marriages of unmarried men and women and instructs unmarried people to remain chaste until God provides for them out of his fadl or bounty. As it says, and then in the next verse it says Marry those among you who are single or the virtuous ones among yourselves male or female if they are in poverty Allah will give them means out of his grace Allah is of ample means and aware. Let those who do not find the means to marry be abstinent until Allah enriches them of His grace. Chapter 24, verses 32 and 33. When they become married, they share this blessing as reflected in Quranic discussion of God's blessing to mankind, among all the blessings that God has given to mankind. One of his signs is that he created for you from among yourselves spouses so that you may find tranquility with them and he ordained affection and mercy among you love and mercy among you surely in this there are signs for people who reflect chapter 30 verse 21 this says when a man and woman use their intellect, their mind, to understand each other and decide they are right for each other, then Allah will put love and affection in their hearts. So love comes afterwards. Plus, it says Allah will make it so they have mercy toward each other. When one makes a mistake or has certain needs, especially in the old age, or Quran reminds men, Hunna libasun lakum wa antum libasun lahunna. 
your wives are a garment to you and you are a garment to them. Chapter 2 verse 187. Suggesting that marriage provides warmth, comfort, and protection, much like a garment. It also strengthens human relationships by acquiring relatives through marriage. This is another aspect that Quran talks about. And it is he who created the human from water and gave him relatives through blood and marriage. Chapter 25, verse 54 which provides a mean of acquiring also uh, offsprings. God has made you, made for you, spouses from among yourself and through them has given you children and grandchildren and provided you of the good things. Chapter 16, verse 72. Such is the importance of marriage that it is part of the ultimate reward believers hope for. Which again says, Jannatu Adnin Yatchulunaha wa man salaha min abaihim wa azwajihim wa durriyatihim. Going to paradise where both spouses, spouses will be joined together along with the righteous ones among their parents and offsprings, kids, children. Chapter, you know, we have several verses like this. Chapter 13, verse 23, or chapter 52, verses 20 and 21, or chapter 25, verse 74. In line with Quranic teachings, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who is the model for all Muslims to follow, had a rich, successful married life. And according to Ahmad's Musnad, the Prophet ﷺ said that marriage was part of the way of life he lived. And whoever shunned that way of life did not belong with him. On the other hand, Christ, Jesus Christ, does not provide such a model of marriage for Christians, nor did he urge his followers to marry in a similar way. Whereas celibacy and staying unmarried is commandable for those who devote, devote themselves to religious life in Christianity. The Quran denounces, actually, denounces this as a, you know, and, and, and rejects it as a human invention, a bid'ah, in uh, chapter, in verse 27, chapter 57. Because Islam attaches such importance to marriage, it makes it easy to enter into. There's no bureaucracy involved in getting married in Islam. And the wedding ceremony is short and simple requiring no more than a proposal and acceptance, spoken in front of two witnesses, and payment of the dowry to the woman, to the wife. There is no requirement for an official place or a person or any specified time. In common with the treatment of other themes, the Qur'an mainly talks about marriage in general terms giving some recommendations as stated above. It is not a detailed text telling people how to live their daily lives, but goes into detail only in the following areas when it comes to marriage. Well, number one, when it talks about what is forbidden or situations that lead to forbidden things. Number two, when it talks about people's rights. Number three, when it replies to specific questions that have been asked. The rest it leaves for humans to figure out, and they do. Therefore, 
For example, the Quran lists all categories of men or women that a person is not, is not allowed to marry. Then declares, declares, beyond that is made lawful for you to marry. On verse 24, chapter 4. It lists individuals' inheritance rights in great details. Uh, in verses 11 through 13 in chapter 4 and verse 176. And the rights of women are protected, including the rights to dowry, accommodation, and provision, and the legitimacy of offsprings. The Quran sets out rights for the wife and then allows her to willingly waive some such as the dowry, if she chooses, in verse 4 and 24 of chapter 4. The general statements in the Qur'an are normally elaborated in the tradition of the Prophet, in the Sunnah of Prophet. For instance, the Qur'an recommends that men should consider the importance of belief when choosing a wife. Is this wife a true believer? This is reflected in verse two, 221, verse, chapter 2. And the Prophet, alayhi salam, elaborates on this in the tradition. He explains that a woman may be sought for marriage for four reasons. Her wealth, her beauty, her family, or her piety and iman. But the Prophet ﷺ recommends that a man choose a woman of piety and iman. Otherwise, he will end up empty-handed. This stresses the importance of starting families on solid foundation so that the marriage can last. We all know and have seen the struggles some married couples have had when they start the marriage with different ideology and beliefs, no matter how trivial they may seem at the time. Especially after the children come, problems get worse. Couples need to discuss where exactly they are with their Iman and religious practices and where they think they are going. Some people get religious after marriage and expect the same from their spouses. But you cannot force your spouse to practice if their heart is not in it. All these need to be discussed in advance. That is why you go into marriage with the brain first, not the emotions. According to the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ, no one should be forced to marry anyone that they do not desire. It is the husband's responsibility to pay the dowry and to provide for his wife and family. The way that both husband and wife should conduct themselves in marriage is set out in the Qur'an. Marital relationships should involve the qualities of affection, peacefulness or tranquility, and mercy, as mentioned in the verse that we recited, verse 21, chapter 3. And the example of the prophet is the, is the recommended norm. In other words, what prophet said sets the standard. He said, the best of you are those who are best to their families. The consultations which are enjoined on all Muslims in conducting their common affairs become important in marriage as well. And we find mutual acceptance and consultations you know, occurring frequently, but always in the mutual or give and take form when it comes to marriage. You see the examples in verse 234, chapter 2, 
verse 6, chapter 65, verse 232, chapter 2, uh, and so on. Another frequent term or expression used in the Qur'an is ma'ruf, which means what is good and commandable. Indeed, this word ma'ruf occurs four times in one page. If you read the verses 232 through 236 in chapter 2, for example, you see it says, فَأَمْسَكُوهُنَّ بِمَعْرُوفٍ أَوْ سَرَّحُوهُنَّ بِمَعْرُوفٍ Either take them back on equitable terms with kindness or set them free on equitable terms with kindness. This is verse 231 in chapter 2. Or we have فَلَا تَعْضُلُوهُنَّ أَنْ يَنْكِحْنَ أَزْوَاجِهُنَّ إِذْ إِذَا تَرَاضُوا بَيْنَهُمْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Do not prevent them from marrying their husband if they mutually, mutually agree on equitable terms. Verse 232, chapter 2. Therefore, compulsion within marriage is prohibited, according to verses 231 and 232 in chapter uh, 2. The marriage contract is considered to be a very strong bond that should stop injustice or ill treatment as the Quran says وَكَيْفَ تَأْخُذُونَهُ وَقَدْ أَفْضَى بَعْضَكُمْ إِلَى بَعْضٍ وَأَخَذْنَا مِنْكُمْ مِيثَاقًا قَلِيلًا How can you take it back when you've had intimate relations and made a strong agreement with each other? Verse 21, chapter 4 Plus, while married, marriage is a strong covenant or an important contract between a man and a woman, witnessed by God. However, at the end of the day, it is a contract, which means, which means the husband does not own the wife like a slave, so he can beat her or uh, beat her to submission or do whatever he wishes with her. Nor does the wife own the husband, owns the husband. Not that Islam allows any of it, even with a slave, as we have discussed in detail in the past. The physical or intimate relationship is considered very important, and God mentions the believers partake in it. Prophet considered this a commandable act. When one of the companions asked him, how can this be so? The prophet explained. If you did it with someone other than your wife, would you not be punished for it? Then, equally, you will be rewarded for it when it will be with your wife. The prophet recommended that men should approach the physical relationship with proper, proper affection and the right mood for both parties. When women are menstruating, husbands should not have intercourse with them as it is painful and unclean. Verse 222 in chapter 2. The good deed here is to make the marriage as God has intended, full of affection and mercy. Affection and mercy and any misbehavior in this intimate situation will be recorded and they will face the consequences of the, their bad or good acts on judgment day before God. Both husbands and wives are reminded that they should literally guard their private parts from, uh, you know, from approaching others or being approached by other than their husband and wives. This is in verse 35, chapter 33. Believers are described in the Quran as following. وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبْلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ عَيُّنٍ وَجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا Those who pray, our Lord, give us full contentment and joy 
in our spouses and offsprings the comfort of our eyes and make us an example to be followed by the pious. Chapter 25, verse 74. The Prophet ﷺ advised that if a man sees a woman and feels any desire for her, he should return to his wife. He should return to his wife. The husband who is responsible for maintaining his family should not squander his money or even give it away in charity to the disadvantage of his own family. When a companion of the Prophet asked him, whether he should give away all his wealth to charity, the Prophet said, no. The man asked, can I give half? The Prophet said, no. The man asked, a third, and even that was too much. The Prophet said, it is better for you to leave your family well provided, for if you die, rather than leave them to beg from other people. He also said, only a good man treats women well, and only a mean man treats them badly. Islam protects married life in many ways. It enjoins chastity on everybody and stipulates a deterrent penalty for violation and defamation of character. No one should go into other people's houses without the owner's permission. And man and woman who are not married and are outside the family circle should not mix freely within houses when they are alone together. See chapter 33 verses 28 through 31 and also verses 58 through 61. Another point, polygyny, or polygyny also means marrying multiple wives, is permitted in the Qur'an. Unlike marriage and divorce, it is only mentioned once. You know, in marriage and divorce topic, we have many verses. But when it comes to up to four wives, it is only mentioned once. And only incidentally, rather than having a separate whole separate section or verse devoted, devoted to it, it is only permitted with the provision that if you feel you may not be equitable to each wife, then you may only marry one. If you cannot be equitable to each wife, you may only marry one. Verse 3, verse uh, chapter 4. So it is neither obligatory nor highly recommended, not even recommended, merely allowed in certain circumstances. And that's a misconception. Some people say you have to marry four wives. No, it's only allowed up to four. Muslim scholars like Al-Aqad have written in justification of this institution. They argue that in some marriages it can be advisable if, for instance, the first wife is not well or has lost interest in marital relations or cannot bear children. In such situations, if the husband is barred from marrying another wife, he may find no alternatives but to divorce the present wife. And that's not a solution. Also, in such circumstances, if polygyny was not allowed, men could be driven toward having a, a forbidden or haram relationship. In situations where women outnumber men, polygyny also provides a solution in a religious morality that does not allow sexual relationship sexual relationships outside marriage women however cannot be forced into polygyny as the second wife enters into the marriage
the first wife or any wife could stipulate in marriage contract that the husband may not enter into another marriage without her consent. This, this is actually practiced by some women in Muslim countries today. Now, what about difficulties in marriage? The Qur'an instructs men to live with their wives bil ma'roof, with kindness according to the accepted norms, and advises them that if they dislike their wives, they should remember that they may dislike something in which God has placed much goodness. For example, in verse 19 of chapter 4, وَعَاشِرُوهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ فَإِنْ كَرَهْتُمُوهُنَّ فَعَسَرًا تَكْرَهُوا شَيْئًا وَيَجْعَلَ اللَّهُ فِي خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا And live with them in kindness and equity. If you dislike them, it may be that you dislike something through which Allah brings about a great deal of good. The Prophet ﷺ said, A good believer should not hate his wife, if he dislikes one characteristic of her, there are other characteristics which will be pleasing. In difficult situations, the society is urged to, to care for families and send an arbiter from the husband's side and one from the wife's side to try to bring about, you know, peace between them, reconciliation before legal separation or divorce as mentioned in verse 35, chapter 4. But, serious situations may require firmness. We will now discuss this first before we discuss the subject of divorce. We'll jump right into it. And you may hit them. In discussing the position of women in Islam, an important Quranic verse in chapter 4, the famous verse 34 in chapter 4, is frequently referred to people, especially by people, especially uninformed women, women who are not informed well, or the critics of Islam, often in a sensational way as it's seen to give men the right to beat women. So now we analyze this verse. What is it really saying? Under what condition? And what is really meant by this verse? And under which context? And how, how does Sunnah explain it? Besides, how does ex uh, Quran itself explain it? A close examination of the verse in question shows that it has been subjected both in the popular understanding and even by some commentators and translators to selective and subjective interpretation. Taken out of context, exaggeration and blatant disregard for Prophet's own interpretation of certain elements of this verse. The first things first, the translation. English translations of the Quranic uh, verse have contributed to the popular picture of the treatment of women in Islam. And in some translations, most of the words of the passage have been misunderstood and mistranslated. The whole context of the passage and its purpose is often completely ignored. Misinterpretation is usually based on male chauvinism, copying the views of others without close examination of the passage itself, and an, an age-old prejudice and media sensationalism. So, what is really going on there? According to Abdul Halim, the understanding of the verse should be 
based on three things, three important points. Number one, linguistic analysis of the passage itself. What is the context here? The Qur'an is the supreme authority in Islam, the first. And since this is a text from the Qur'an, it has to be understood on the basis of accepted linguistic criteria. An understanding reached by this method needs no apology or further justification. So that's one. Number two, the Prophet Muhammad's own interpretation of key elements of this verse. The tradition or sunnah is the second authority in Islam. The first role of the Prophet was to deliver the Qur'an, and his second role was to explain it as required. It would be presumptuous of anyone to claim to know the meaning of the Qur'an better than the Prophet ﷺ himself. Number three, the last item which needs to be considered is what the Qur'an itself says in other verses within the passage about difficulties in the marital relationship and how to deal with them and what the Prophet said about how wives should be treated. Given all three things above, opinions of Muslims or non-Muslims, scholars or laymen cannot be accepted as having higher authority than the Qur'an and the Sunnah in determining the meaning of this verse on marital relations in Islam. The verse says, الرِّجَالُ قَوَّامُونَ عَلَى النِّسَاءِ بِمَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بَعْضُهُمْ عَلَى بَعْضٍ وَبِمَا أَنْفَقُوا مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ فَالسَّالِحَاتُ قَانِتَاتٌ حَافِظَاتٌ لِلْغَيْبِ بِمَا حَفِظَ اللَّهُ وَالْآتِ يَتَخَافُونَ نُشُوزَهُنَّ فَعَدُوهُنَّ فَهْجِرُوهُنَّ فِي الْمَزَاجِعِ وَاضْرِبُوهُنَّ فَإِنْ أَتَعْنَكُمْ فَلَا تَبْغُوا عَلَيْهِنَّ سَبِيلًا إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلَيًّا كَبِيرًا Let's start by examining one popular translation of the passage. We'll talk about the proper one later. Men have authority over women because God has made the one superior to the others. Um... And because they spend their wealth to maintain them. God, good women are obedient. They guard their unseen parts because God has guarded them. As for those from whom you fear disobedience, admonish them and send them to bed apart and beat them. Then, if they obey you, take no further action against them. God is high, supreme. This is translation by Dawood. Now, this is a trap, typical translation. In the first verse, in the very first beginning of the verse, Abdul Halim lists about a dozen words which have been misinterpreted or given rise to misunderstanding in the existing translations. Let's consider some terms in this verse first, and then we'll talk about you know, uh, the relationship and so on. First, we have men and women. They mean husband and wives because the passage goes on to mention intimate relations between couples and arbitration that may lead to divorce. This is both verses 34 and 35. Why does the verse not say husband and wife then? Because the word zawj, which in modern Arabic means husband, applies in classical Arabic to both sexes. Zawj is used in the passage. It has no gender. Zawj means husband or wife. It is like in the English, the word spouse. Spouse in, in, in English, which apply to both wife and husband. 
And it would not have made sense to say spouses are given more than spouses. It wouldn't make sense and it wouldn't be clear. This can also be seen in other parts of the Qur'an where husbands and wives are mentioned, the same terminology of men and women is used. The verse is thus taking the, uh, this verse, we're talking about verse 34, which is related to marriage, men and women, is talking about husband and wives, not men and women in general. This distinction is important because those who misunderstand the verse take it to mean that God has given men in general more than women. And in general, applying that to, you know, when you say general, then applying it extensively and interpolating, uh, people would think that men are given more. More what? Maybe some have, uh, you know, uh, interpreted as strength, some intelligence, some have said wisdom, some have even said beard. You know, men have more than women in terms because they have beard. Then they go on from that to say that women cannot be judges, heads of state, or in any position of leadership over men. And this is a complete misreading of the verse. Secondly, we come to the key word, قَوَّامُونَ ala. In English translations, you find such rendering as have authority over them or in charge of the affair of uh, protectors and maintainers of in arabic vocabulary the expression rawama ala means merely maintain her and attend to her affairs or simply put taking care of her that's it you can see it in al ghamus several uh, you know versions that taking care of her. The hadith also explains the meaning of qawwam. Qawwama at the time of the Prophet. In, um, if we go to Sahih Bukhari, the chapter on sales, Jabir ibn Abdullah, a companion of the Prophet, explains that he chose to marry an older experienced woman because he had young orphan sisters and he wanted a woman, he wanted a woman to take care of them and to gather them and comb their hair, take care of them. However, judging by the, by the rest of the verse, it appears that there is another role, one which makes the husband the chairman of the family, so to speak. The hadith goes on. Every one of you, talking about family members, every one of you is a shepherd and will be held responsible for his charges or his roles. The man is a shepherd in his house and is responsible for his charges. The woman is a shepherd and she is responsible for her charges. Even the servant is a shepherd over his master's property and he will be responsible for his charges. So, we have uh, something called group management in Islam. And we can also say it's good group management in Islam. Islam attaches great importance to people being together in a group with a leader. Praying together, led by an imam, increases the reward for each individual. The Prophet had a distinct desire for good management and said, If there are three of you on a journey, let them appoint one of them as Amir, the one in charge. And when he sent a group of people away for any purpose, he would see that they had an Amir. He would appoint an emir for them. Though not to bully, bully them, because he said, the Sayyid, the chief of a group of people, is their servant. You can see that in Kashful Khafa. 
Similarly, he advised that the pace of a traveling company should be set to suit the weakest among them. Just much like when we, uh, you know, the imam in a prayer should set his pace to suit the old and the mothers who need to attend to their babies. So, just like a company that must have a chairman, chairman of the board, or a president, or CEO, anywhere in the world, in Islam, the family, which is the fundamental unit of the society, must also have a head of, uh, you know, head of or a chairman as well. In the Quran, this role is assigned to the husband, who has the responsibility to provide and maintain the family, whereas the wife is not obliged to maintain the family or even herself. Please understand, the gawama or stewardship of the family that is assigned to the husband does not give him open or unlimited authority. It is limited by the Quranic principle of ma'roof and works according to the principle of shura, consultation. Awama is part of mu'ashara, living together. In verse 19, chapter 4, husbands are ordered وَعَاشِرُوهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Consort, live with them بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Meaning in a good manner, in accordance with what is honorable and commandable. This is in verse 19, chapter 4. Al-Ma'roof is taken for granted in the marriage contract. In the Quran, by virtue of the marriage contract, husband, husbands make a strong pledge to their wives. In verse, 4, uh, verse 21, chapter 4, understood by scholars to be living together according to what is honorable and commandable. That's what al-ma'roof means here in this context. As for the principle of shura, the Quran describes the believers as those who, whose affairs quote unquote are conducted by consultation. In verse 38, chapter 42. This is a general and permanent description that was revealed in Mecca long before political life was started in Medina. Naturally, it applies to the most basic social unit, the family. It has been seen above that such expressions of reciprocity as muashar and tashawar, tashawar means mutual uh, consultation, taravi, mutual acceptance, are frequent in Quranic discussion of family matters. Look at verse 233, chapter 2. Now, back to the role of qawama, which involves the husband's responsibility to maintain and look after his wife, is different from merely ruling over the wife, as it is made explicitly in the book of Genesis in the Bible. In there, there is a punishment for making Adam, peace be upon him, eat from the fruit. Eve, his wife, was told that her pains would be multiplied in conception, you know, when delivering the baby. As it says, In sorrow shall you bring forth children, and you desire, your desire shall be to your husband, and he shall rule over you. Rule over you. Now, a third concept that has been misinterpreted is the Arabic expression Bima um, Fadlallah. Bima Fadlallah, which explains the basis of Qawwama. There's one translator who says, in, that's Yusuf Ali. Because God has given the one more strength, and the strength is in, uh, in parentheses, than the other. Others say, 
because God has preferred in bounty one of them over another. That's arbory. Or because God made the one of them to excel the other, pictal. And there's another one because God has made the one superior to the other, Dawood. The root of the concept of fadl, fadl in Arabic means to give more. In Arabic vocabulary, fadl is ziyada, i.e. more. Besides that also it's used as bounty. That is why some commentators understood it to be the extra in the share of inheritance. You see, in, in, the, in the verses inheritance, thinking that this is corroborated by verse 32 in chapter 4, while others thought it was strength, it, it referred to strength, intelligence, and so on, or even the beard. However, this is all based on a hasty, incorrect reading of the text, which assumes that ma, ma in ma fadala, in ma fadala, has the same grammatical function in uh, verses 32 and 34 of chapter 4. It does not. In verse 32 of chapter 4, it is a relative pronoun, meaning that which, that which God has given more of to some other than, uh, some, uh, than the others. As such, it requires an additional proposition and a pronoun, bihi, bihi. In verse 34, our verse that we're discussing in chapter 4, on the other hand, ma is masteria. It merely turns the verb into verbal noun. Bi tafdil Allah. Bi tafdil Allah. By the appointment of God. Therefore, in verse 32, men have something extra given to them, i.e., we're talking about the share of inheritance there, which in 4, uh, 34, there's only the assignment of the role of Qawama, assignment of the chairmanship of the family to the husband. So there, we're talking about something material, which is in, in verse 32, uh, so that tafadl means uh, what God has given them in terms of inheritance, shares of inheritance. But in the verse we are discussing regarding the marriage, verse 34, it's talking about assignment of the role of Qawwama. That is something extra that God has assigned to men over women. Assignment of the chairmanship of the family to the husband, if you will. The verse thus means men maintain and attend to their wives because God has assigned this extra role to them. And because of what they, there's an end to it because there's another reason, because of what they spend of their money on the family. Now, in verse 228, chapter 2, Quran mentions the rights and obligations of wives. They have rights similar to the rights men have over them, according to what is ma'roof. But men have a daraja, a degree over them, like the above, more or extra. This word daraja or degree has been interpreted by some as referring to the extra share of inheritance. However, since within the marriage of two living people, the question of inheritance does not arise, the degree clearly refers to the role of Qawwama, circumscribed in the way described above. It is interesting to note that the Qur'an does not say because God has given men more than women. It doesn't say that. But says God has given some more than others. 
does not even mention the gender, the sex. This expression occurs a number of times, this is not the only place, to refer to the nature of things, namely that in this world some have been given more wealth. For example, in chapter 16, verse 71, وَاللَّهُ فَضَّلَ بَعْدَكُمْ عَلَى بَعْدٍ فِي الرِّزْقِ Allah has given some more than others in wealth, in money. In, in our verse, verse 34, for husband, this more than others is the stewardship of the family, management and responsibility of the family. So, because he's been given the responsibility to provide and take care of the family through his earnings, he is then charged with the job of family management. Each will be judged according to how they conduct themselves with what they have been given, husband or wife. Whatever responsibility they have been given, they will be judged accordingly. And raised some of you in rank above others so that he might test you in what he has given you. Chapter 6, verse 165. Having established for the husband the role of qawwama, and then of course he's going to be tested accordingly, set the expectation there. So having established for the husband the role of qawwama, or maintenance and stewardship of the family, the Qur'an goes on to divide wives into two classes. The good ones, who are described as salihat, righteous, and bad ones who are not, who are not among the salihat. The salihat does not simply mean good as wives. Salih is a general term to describe men or women who are righteous in observing the tenets of religion, in observing the tenets of the religion. Devout believers who are obedient to God. These good wives are described in two ways. As number one, qanitat, qanitat, which translators render as just obedient. This is misleading because it gives the impression that they are obedient to their husband. Whereas the term is used in the Qur'an solely as being devotedly obedient to God. Go and look at verse 9, chapter 39, and verse 35, chapter 33. I repeat, just qanitat, and if you just translate it as obedience, some will, it will be misleading because it gives the impression that they are obedient to their husband, whereas the term is used in the Qur'an solely as being devotedly obedient to God, according to uh, verse 35, chapter 33, and verse 9, chapter 39. Number two, the second description given to good women, the righteous women, hafidat, a term used in the Qur'an for women, and hafidun for men who guard their private parts, equivalent to chest. You can look at chapter 23, verse 5, or chapter 33, verse 35. This includes guarding their private parts from approaching or being approached by anyone other than their spouse. Then we have the term lil ghaib. Lil ghaib means that the wife is chaste in his absence when the husband is away from her or she's faithful to him. She's expected to guard her chastity because بما حفظ الله God has ordered these things to be guarded. God has ordered these things to be guarded. In the Quran, God's order in this respect is for men and women alike. You can see that 
in chapter 24, verses 30 and 31. Thus, being obedient to God and being chaste are the only two qualities by which a good wife is described here. And we can see that they are not excessive requirements. They are required of any Muslim of any gender, really, when you think about it. On the other side comes the other class of women whose nushuz is feared by the husband. Nushuz, translated mainly as rebellion through Dawood translator, translation, um, or some have translated disobedience. Rebellion or disobedience, those are the two that have been used. In Arabic lexicon, nushuz means literally rising above, standing in high place and announcing rebellion, which is what you do when you go against or above the authority, as you rebel. So a wife in this situation puts herself above her husband, not just equal to her husband. She goes against her husband's honor, trying to be unfaithful to him. Please listen to the words, what Nushuz mean. And, uh, you know, she goes against her husband's honor, trying to be unfaithful to him and marriage, her marriage vows. Nushuz here is not referred to an ordinary household dispute or disagreement that usually occurs in any marriage. Rather, those related to sanctity of marriage, related to honor and dignity that must be protected. In this verse, we see a contrast between the righteous, devout, and obedient woman to God and the one who is not by denoting her rebellion or disobedience to God, hence disloyalty to her husband. So the proper translation of verse uh, 34 is, Husbands are maintainers, caretakers of their wives with the bounties. God has given to some more than others and with, with what they spend out of their own money, their own wealth, earnings. Righteous wives are devout and guard what God would have them guard in their husband's absent, absence. If you fear disloyalty or rebellion from your wives, remind them of the teachings of God. Then ignore them when you go to bed or boycott them. We'll talk about this later. Then strike them. If they obey you, you have no rights to act against them. God is most high and great. So, Let's discuss this a little bit more and the rest of the verse. It is with these pretexts that the husbands are instructed to go through three stages. The critics of this verse, unfortunately there are some of them amongst women as well, often ignore or forget this term, which is why all these instructions are given to the husband, the term nushus. And they just jump to the part that says, hit them. Here again, we have a misinterpretation of the concept of nushuz, and misinterpretation and mistranslation of three stages recommended in dealing with a wife in nushuz, a rebellious wife. The proper meaning should be derived on the basis of three criteria listed above, namely, linguistic analysis of the text, of the Qur'an, what the Prophet said and did, and what the Qur'an says elsewhere using the same terminology and about dealing with wives in difficult situation. Let us briefly consider nushuz in the light of these considerations. Number one, it is clear that the contrast in this passage between the first and second type of women cannot be ignored. There is a contrast. In this verse, we see a contrast between the righteous, devout, and obedient woman and the one who is not by denoting her 
rebellion or disobedient to God. Hence, disloyal to her husband. The second class of uh, wife here is the opposite of those who are uh, de devoutly obedient to God and guarding their private parts, which God has ordered to be guarded. So what we have here is a woman whose husband fears the beginning of un, her, uh, the beginning of her unfaithfulness and her disregard for the commands of God. This is the kind of wife this instruction is given for. Not a wife who disobeyed her husband, wishes to cook a certain food, or did not give certain instruction to the kids, or etc. Number two. This linguistic understanding is corroborated by the interpretation of the prophet in his farewell speech, heard by thousands of people as he said, you have rights over your wives and they have rights over you. You have the right that they should not defile or dishonor your bed. I think that's clear. You have the right that they should not defile or dishonor your bed and that they should not commit flagrant lewdness or deliberate and open indecency. If they do, God allows you to put them in a separate room and to strike them, but not with severity. This is a portion of Prophet Alayhi Salam's uh, favorable speech. Uh, this particular one came from Life of Muhammad by Ibn Ishaq, uh, collected by Guillaume. But to put them in a separate room is a mistranslation by Guillaume um, from its original Arabic um, um, composition, as we shall see later. It should be, it should read like this, to refrain from speaking to them in the bedroom. The prophet did not say here that husbands have the rights of absolute disobedience or to discipline for any kind of offense. He defined the exact circumstances in which the sanctions apply. We should also point out here that the different stages of treatment are given as a permission not an order, as the Prophet made it clear in his speech. Adin alakum, adin alakum, the term adin alakum, God has allowed you. So husbands may choose not to apply the sanction, not to apply these stages. Number three, in the last, in, the, at, in at least six chapters, the Qur'an mentions difficulties in marriage, divorce, and even the aftermath of divorce. Even when husbands dislike their wives, they are instructed, consort with them in a good manner. Bil ma'roof. For if you dislike them, it may, be, it may happen that you dislike something in which God placed, places much goodness. This is verse 19, chapter 4. Even if they experienced hostility from their wives and children, men are warned merely to be aware of it, but advise that to pardon, overlook, and forgive is better because God is forgiving and merciful. And that's again chapter 64, verse 14. Even in divorce proceedings, with all the bitterness, husbands are forbidden to harass their wives or make their wives uh, make the the wives' lives difficult. And you can see those evidences in verses 19, chapter 4, and verses 1 and 6, chapter 65. It should be done with kindness, according to verse 229, chapter 2. Verse 1, chapter 67. 
However, there is a significant exception from this magnanimity. Like in verse 19, chapter 4, uh, verse 1, chapter 65, also chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 15 and 25, except when they commit a flagrant lewdness or an act of unfaithfulness. Both in verse 19, chapter 4 and verse 1, chapter 65. This again corroborates our understanding that the nushus in our present verse means a serious offense of infidelity or unfaithfulness, a rebellion. Now, before we consider these measures and how they progress from one stage to another, we need to remember what we have already said about the honor God gives to both men and women, giving women their rights for which they are qualified by being human. And then also we should remember that a Muslim woman retain, uh, retains her independent civil status. She's still a, a, a person, a member of the society. The fact that man is placed in charge of the family does not deprive the woman of her right to choose her marriage partner and to administer her personal and financial affairs, her own personal and financial affairs from her own earnings. This is also the great importance Islam attaches to the family and helps us to understand clearly why these disciplinary measures have been allowed and the nature of their application. The word fear, takhafun, further proves the nature of this dispute or rebellion or nushuz and, it's not, and, and shows that it's not like common household dispute. The word, the word fear. A husband never really fears that his wife would buy the wrong color of clothing or cook the wrong food or raising her voice. This is not something a husband fears, but he does fear infidelity and its signs. Hence the use of the term fear in this verse, tahafun. These measures are not given to aggravate the situation nor increase, you know, the hatred. In fact, if that is feared, if the husband thinks this will make the situation worse, then he should not administer it. He should stay away from it. There is no battle or competition between the husband and the wife. These measures are not aimed at knocking the wife on the head uh, when she begins to rebel and confining her to her prison cell. No, no such thoughts are ever condoned by Islam. Unfortunately, however, some Muslim men have mistaken this verse to abuse their wives by beating them, which couldn't be any further from the truth of the verse. This thought might have crept into the tradition of certain societies at certain stages. Such measures, however, are an indication that mankind, not just Muslims, but mankind, not merely one gender, but all mankind, the whole of mankind, have sunk to a very low depth. In Islam, the situation is widely different in form, substance, and goal. As for those women who, from whom you have reason to fear rebellion, admonish them first. Reminding, admonishing, is the first stage. It is responsibility of the one who is in charge of the family to give admonition, warning against inappropriate tendencies. Allah says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قُوْ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَهْلِيكُمْ نَارًا وَقُودُهَا نَاسُ وَالْحِجَارَ وَقُودُهَا نَاسُ وَالْحِجَارَ Believers, protect yourself, ward off 
from yourself and your families that fire of the hereafter, whose fuel is human beings and stones. Chapter uh, 66, verse 6. So, a man in charge has to do what? He has to take the measure. In dealing with a wife in Nushuz, in the state of Nushuz, the three stages that are permitted are, number one, فَعَذُوهُنَّ فَعَذُوهُنَّ which translators render as admonish them, give them advice, but this is not entirely correct. It's correct to some extent. Ra'ad in Arabic is reminding of God and his teachings. This meaning of the word is used in the Quran and this reminding is the core of the lexicon meaning in Arabic so that the person who is reminded may take heed of the message. So fa'aduhunnar means reminding of God and his teachings. Then step number two is wahjeruhunna fil mazajir. Which translators render uh, variously as uh, send them to beds apart. This is by Dawood. Banish them to beds apart, Pictal. Banish them to their couches, Arbery. Refuse to share their beds, Yusuf Ali. Leave them alone in bed, Asad. Those who say send them or banish them have a basic misunderstanding of the verb. Even if it is understood as leaving, it is the man who is to leave, who is asked to leave, not the woman. It's interesting how translators under, uh, understood the verb to mean sending or banishing women. Misunderstanding also arises from the term hajr, hajr, which people seem to relate to hijra, immigration, but hajr also means a verbal boycott. As the Prophet ﷺ said, it is not lawful for a Muslim to have hajr with his brother for more than three days. They meet each other, one turns his face one way, the second to the other way. The best of them is the one who first greets the other. The one person who does not speak to the other or verbal boycott. That's what Hajj means. And this is what it implies in our verse. Now, whether we take it as leaving her bed, which is the correct translation, not sending her, but leaving her bed or boy boycotting her, not speaking to her, there are certain rules that apply as to how this measure is taken. It is confined to the room where the couple is alone. It should not be obvious to children so that they are not adversely affected by it. This boycott is suggested only in bed, not in front of the children or others. A husband who fears that his wife may have started acts of leading, acts that are leading to unfaithfulness in his own house and in his absence should not be blamed by anyone for boycotting her for a while in bed or leaving her bed as others meant to translate. He should not be blamed for this. It must also be remembered that it is the duty of any Muslim, man or a woman, if they see someone misbehaving, to go through the stage of wa'ad, verbal reminding, and if this does not work, to show disapproval by boycotting them, not talking to them. Or if you want to say walking away, it is an obligation on every Muslim in accordance with the Prophet's tradition that says, whoever sees a munkar, munkar is something objected by the religion, should change it with his hand first. And if he cannot, then with his tongue. And if he cannot, then with his heart. And this is the least degree of faith. So the husband here is like any Muslim treating any other Muslim 
when he sees a munkar. Now, the third, the third stage is Vadrabu Hunna, strike her. Vadrabu Hunna, this is done only if the first two stages do not work. The husband has no right to jump from one stage to another or put, the, or put them in the wrong order. As Al Shafi'i said, start with what God started with. This applies to any Quranic injunction which lists options in this way. Now, the term Wadrubu Hunna comes from Dharaba, which has many meanings, among which are to set forth, to go forth, travel or leave, put over, and strike, all of which have been used in different forms and meanings throughout the Qur'an. The term is not used here figuratively, like to give example or set forth a parable, although there are opinions on it. The most common meaning for this word used in translation or commentary is striking her. However, it has also been translated as leaving her. It should be remembered that the Qur'an mentions striking only once, only once, even though it talks about serious difficulties in marriage in several chapters and verses, this word has only been used once in this context. It should also be remembered that the Prophet, who is the model for all Muslims, never hit or strike any of his wives. He also said, the best of you are those that are best in treating their wives. It is only a good man who treats women well, and only a mean man treats them badly. Is any of you who beats his wife not ashamed to beat her and then sleep with her? Now, it may well be asked, how could the Prophet, who was the most obedient person to the instructions of the Qur'an, condemn striking so much when the Qur'an said, strike them? Unless he understood striking here to be only the ver for the very serious offense he himself mentioned in the farewell speech as we spoke. All Muslim scholars agree that the husband is not allowed to beat the wife severely, since the Prophet said, without severity. In fact, most say that it has to be so light as to be with something like a toothpick, and the toothpick mentioned. The basis for this appears to be in the story that the Prophet was once angered by a servant girl whom he sent on an errand. But she was very late, inordinately late. When she returned, he raised his toothpick and said, If I did not fear God, I would hit you with this, pointing to that toothpick. The word beat causes difficulty as well. Abdul Halim says, when we look at dictionaries, we find the English language rich in expressions like hit, strike, slap, beat, bash, wallop, belt, beat up, thump, and now the new, you know, words come in like batter, in wife battering. Compared to English, however, Arabic has only a very limited range indeed, including the word daraba. This may be uh, why some translated opt for beat, but in English, you don't beat someone with a toothpick. So this, this word beat is completely 
irrelevant in this verse. So beat is not a suitable translation. Hit, or better yet strike, is nearer to the mark. The authority of the husband to strike his wife is circ circumscribed by a number of things. By the Prophet's own practice, he is the model for all Muslims to live by. Um, and by the ending of the verse, you see, the ending of verse 34, God is high and great. Characteristically, this reminds men that if they misbehave, if they abuse, God is watching over them and will deal with them. It is relevant here to mention the story of how the Prophet once saw Ibn Mas'ud with his hand raised, about to hit his slave. The Prophet cried out, God has more power over you than you have over him. So he, as a result, so he dropped his hand and set the slave free. In the theme under discussion, it is important to observe that four successive verses end in the following ways. So all you wife-beating husbands, you know, there are, you, you have to really pay attention at the end of each verse. In the same passage, same verses that are to, we're talking about, same context. And these, uh, these verses are successive, one after the other. So all you wife-beating husbands who try to justify your action with this verse, read the ending of each verse preceding verse 434. We have God knows all things in verse 32. God is ever witness over all things, verse 33. God is ever high, exalted, and great, verse 34. And God is ever knowing and aware, verse 35. There are still more restrictions around the permission to strike. Many Muslim scholars are also of the opinion that hitting is only permissible if the husband is sure that it will bring the right results. Otherwise, it should be avoided. Also, this is not an order from God. And this is actually the reason it, should, the reason it can be avoided is because this is not an order from God to punish her by beating her. All punishments in Islam have to be done by a Muslim judge according to the limits or hudud in Sharia. Hence, the striking is nothing more than a light physical contact to bring about the reality and gravity of, of her indecency and disobedience and bring about to her husband's concern. You see, in, even in a bitter divorce proceedings and nasty legal fights, the husband is not allowed to hit his wife. By the way, and, and, and this is the, you can go and search any verse that is talking about separation, divorce, uh, fights. There is nothing about striking her. By the way, some translation and explanation consider veraba to mean leaving. In other words, after the second action, which is boycotting her, the next step is to leave her instead of striking her. In other words, to remove himself from her company. Well, while this could contextually be considered as a next step, physical separation before the next step could increase the risk of others knowing about their problems earlier. In addition, from linguistic point of view, Adribu Hunna, to mean leave her, is not convincing from structural sense. Plus, this translation raises several questions as to what does leave mean. If it means leaving 
temporarily, then for how long? It doesn't say. If it means divorce, then why does it not use the term divorce? Or why does the next verse talks about bringing relatives or arbiters to mediate? So let's not forget this refers to blatant dishonorable behavior, this nushuz, which is sure to end up in ruin if not stopped. Marriage will be ruined. The husband is shocked as he sees such a behavior. He grabs her or strikes her, which refers to a form of physical contact, stressing, what did you do? Or why do you keep doing this? What you're doing is going to end up to infidelity. Well, Given the situation, his reaction is natural and could happen to any man, Muslim or not. God says you are allowed to have such a reaction for such extreme case of perpetual infidelity. Just enough to give her a wake-up call, bringing the reality into her vision. The verse ends by saying, فَإِنْ أَتَعْنَكُمْ فَلَا تَبْقُوا عَلَيْهِنَّ سَبِيلَ if they obey you, you have no way against them. Obey meaning at any stage of the three actions. And obey means her refraining from the act which caused this problem. As the Quranic verses, listen and obey. Sami'na wa ta'na. You know, you see the examples in other places in the Quran like Verse 16, chapter 64. That is, obey what you have heard in that context. The Prophet himself, in his farewell speech, explained the Quranic phrase, Fa'in ata'anakum. He explained it. If they obey you by using a different word, and he said, Fa'in Ata'nakum means fa'in and tahayna. If they desist, if they stop. In other words, in these three steps that we talked about, first action, second action, the third, if they stop doing what they are doing, uh, their act of indecency, their act of uh, unfaithfulness, you know, then there is no more uh, way for you to react. You're done. Thus, obedience here does not mean being submissive to the husband, but it means refraining from this specific serious offense. To refrain in this way is an obligation on every Muslim. Obedience is only in ma'roof, which means accepted, decent and commandable norms. As already pointed out, this expression bil ma'roof occurs more frequently in situations of difficulties between married couples and in the treatment of wives than anywhere else in the Qur'an. The obedience is not carte blanche and Islamic marriage vows does not include the word love, cherish, and obey. We don't have that. It just means if they obey and stop, obey your request and stop what they're doing, it doesn't have a general uh, statement if they obey everything you say. So when, hus when husband sees such behavior, what is he to do? This is, this is really, you know, people don't think further. So what happens when husband sees such behavior? What is he to do? Just let it go. Then surely unfaithfulness Hence, divorce is to follow, is to come. One might say, why not just divorce her? He can. But Islam says, at this stage, there may still be time to salvage the marriage by giving her, giving her a stern warning through these steps that we talked about before the situation escalates to the point it is too late and divorce is imminent. 
Islam wants to prevent this divorce from uh, happening. It wants to prevent, uh, you know, from getting to that point. This step is an intermediate step in order to prevent further decay and possible divorce and destroying the family, which will be the result. However, again, it is not an order. It is a permission when deemed necessary only for the reason of nushuz mentioned in the verse. However, as we indicated, this step can be skipped if the husband feels the situation can get worse or a divorce is forthcoming anyway or it's too late to take the step. Following this verse, we have verse 35 address to the relatives and all those surrounding the family, including legal authorities. In you read Islahan, you waffer Allah who may in the law, Kana Aliman Habiro. If you fear a breach between the couple, appoint an arbiter. A breach between the couple means if you think they're serious and they're gonna separate, they're gonna divorce, appoint an arbiter from his family and one from hers. If they desire amendment, reconciliation, God will make them of one mind, means they will become agreeable. Allah will cause reconciliation between them. He is ever knowing and aware. Verse 35. In Islamic society, volunteering to be a helper, to bring reconciliation and peace between people is commandable act. As it says in verse 114, chapter 4. This is an open, uh, this is, you know, it, it, well, basically on the individual level, this is true, but the state is also under an obligation to create a body responsible for implementing Quranic teaching. An arbitration, if you will, an Islamic arbitration. An attitude of it's none of my business is against the teachings of the Quran and the Prophet. Even at the stage of fearing a separation, the Quran states, if they desire amendment, God will bring reconciliation. Islam does not favor an early separation when signs of rebellion and hostility begin to appear, nor does it approve that this institution be left to collapse. The institution of marriage is very dear to Islam because it supplies the society with its new members whom it needs for its continued development and progress. Islam recommends this last measure be resorted to when a separation is feared, not after it takes place. After it, separation happens, divorce happens, it happens. It's, it's done. An arbiter from each of the two families of the husband and the wife meet in a friendly atmosphere away from the influences which have caused the relationship between the husband and wife to be strained. And these arbiters must be keen to protect the reputation of both families. They care for the welfare of the children. Neither of them may entertain thoughts of forcing a submission by the other party. They must try to achieve what is best for the husband, the wife, and the children. If, on the other hand, the arbiters, as well as husband and wife, find that it is not possible to reconcile a couple, then such a family is not worth preserving. Indeed, God promises couples who part amicably in the right, on the right conditions, that he will give each something more suitable or better. And ends with the verse with, uh, in the verse with, the scope 
of his provision is boundless and he is all wise meaning that you know he will give them something better it should be noted that with the two types of wives mentioned above the husband is not mentioned at all in relation to a righteous wife he is only he only comes in when the situation of serious offense is under discussion now in this situation one may ask if the Quranic teaching in this matter is not fair and sensible then what should be the alternative this is the question then what's the alternative what else can they do either the husband has to allow himself to become an object of mockery or he has to take the wife to court which would affect the whole family and add to the bitterness or divorce her and therefore break up the family completely surely it is better to remind the wife of her duty first or temper for a while or even strike her lightly and as we spoke the process and if it's still not resolved then go outside of the home and bring an arbiter who could if all attempts at reconciliation fail then decide in favor of a divorce according to the quran it is not fair that a husband who maintains and pays for everything and is under quranic instructions to live with his wife in an honorable kind commandable way should also be asked to put up with acts of infidelity and undermine the whole family one might ask what about the husband what if if uh, the family fear uh, if the wife fears that her husband may be unfaithful to her or desert her or ill treat her incidentally the term nushuz is also used for husband in earlier verse verse 128 in the same chapter 4 where reconciliation is suggested there as well however if reconciliation is not possible the wife can instigate the divorce she can ask for divorce she can also obtain divorce by mutual consent according to verses 229 through 231 no sorry 229 and 31 in chapter 2 or even in cases of cruelty, uh, abandonment, or harm, or if a husband fails to meet his obligations of providing and maintenance. In these latter cases, the woman should apply to the court directly. As mentioned earlier, verse 34 has been subjected to misinterpretation taking it out of context and sensational exaggeration for muslims all for muslims all muslims all the quran is a revelation from god and husbands should obey god in this verse and in all other instructions given in the quran not misinterpret this verse and ignore all other teachings of the quran and tradition on the subject as explained earlier the Quran has set the proper norms for marital relationships that the couple may live peacefully with each other in an atmosphere of love and mercy and among his signs is that he created you mates from amongst yourself so that you may dwell in tranquility with them and he has put love and mercy between your hearts surely there are signs in this for those who reflect chapter 30 verse 21 now now we talk about divorce divorce by the husband divorce has been said by the prophet to be the most disliked lawful thing in the sight of God the most disliked however lawful thing in the sight of God 
However, it is available as a last resort for couples that have no way to reconcile their marriage. It is easily carried out by the husband pronouncing it. There is, we're talking about divorce by husband. There is a waiting period mechanism of a menstrual cycle by which divorce can be affected by. Then, there is a further waiting per period of three months or until child, childbirth for pregnant women, within which the married couple could reconsider. And the wife remains in the marital home. As the Quran says, you do not know God may bring a change of situation. There could be a change of hearts. Within this uh, waiting period, the husband can revoke, actually revoke the divorce by uh, and, and as he pronounced it by word or deed, spelled out in Surah at talaq chapter 65, verses 1 through 7. After the waiting period, the divorce becomes final. But if the couple reconcile and then later on divorce is sought again, the same procedure as described above will pertain. If divorce is pronounced for a third time, it's been proven beyond a doubt that this unhappy marital situation should not continue any longer. The husband may not marry his divorced wife again unless she happens to marry someone else in between. If that second husband were to die or divorce her, it becomes possible for the first husband to enter into marriage with her again. These are all according to verses 229 through 230, chapter 2. So, there is a freedom of action within limits. And this is also the Quranic position during marital difficulties. Thus, we find statements like, there's no blame on you for doing such and such. And on the other hand, these are the limits which you must not cross. Uh, in two pages, for example, we have the statement like, there is no blame on you, repeated seven, seven times, but also there are bounds mentioned. Again, chapter 2, verses 229 through 240, and also in chapter 65, of course. This gives freedom of action to deal with the numerous situations that can arise at different times and under different cultures and conditions. The flexibility of Islamic law in this respect is remarkable. In fact, whenever divorce is mentioned in the Quran, revocation is also recommended. And whenever revocation is recommended, we find the statements like, if they can uphold the limits set by God, um, in verses 229 to 231 in chapter 2. Or, this is conditional upon no harm being caused. Uh, same, same verses. A continuation of marriage must involve the original objective of affection, love, and mercy. Establishing rights and observing the limits set by God. If this is not possible, then it is better for husband and wife to leave each other. And if they separate, if they separate, God will give them something better out of his boundless resources. As, it, as the Quran says, وَإِن يَتَفَرَّقَ يُغْنِ اللَّهُ كُلًّا مِنْ سَعَتِهِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ وَاسِعًا حَكِيمًا but if they separate, Allah will compensate each out of his abundance. Allah is ever all embracing all wise. Chapter 4, verse 130. This is stated in the Arabic in a conditional sentence, which is understood in the Quran to be a promise from God, and he does not break his promises. Divorce, therefore, will be effected in order to start new solid marriages and to strengthen the marriage institution itself. After divorce, the original 
state resumes, meaning that marriage becomes highly recommended for any divorced Muslim and becomes an obligation for those who cannot live without exercising their sexual drives. During marriage difficulties, the Quran keeps repeating statements like, if you believe in God and the Day of Judgment, or remember that God is watching over you, remember that He knows better than you, be conscious of God and know that he has knowledge of everything. These are all in chapter 2, verses 230 to 242, or chapter 4, verses 32 to 36, or chapter 65. You see, in the, even in the middle of divorce negotiations and financial settlement, etc., when people can be bitter, the Quran interrupts the discussion to state in one verse, keep up your daily prayers and stand before God in obedience. Bef before it resumes the discussion, the, the separation discussion again. You see that in verse 238, chapter 2. In order to put people back on track on priorities and remembrance of God. Divorce then carries no stigma whatsoever in Islam nor does it attach anything to divorcees who wish to remarry and resume their married sex life. The Qur'an recognizes that those who have been used to married life are particularly likely to need it more and forbid, forbids women's family from interfering and preventing divorced women from remarrying their previous husbands. It says, do not prevent her from remarrying her husband if they have come to an, an honorable agreement. This is an enjoined on those of you who believe in God and the last day. It is more honorable for you and purer. God knows and you do not. Uh, verse 32 on cha in chapter 2. When a woman or a man becomes divorced, the same original instructions to get married and for society to bring about the marriage of unmarried members resumes. In this respect, there is an obvious difference between the Qur'an and the Gospel. In the Bible, Mark 10, verses 11 and 12, Christ says, Anyone who, do, who divorces his wife and marries another woman, he will be committing adultery. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another man, she will have committed adultery. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 32, it says, But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Also in Luke uh, chapter 18, verse 16, the same thing. In spite of these clear statements, since 1983, the Anglican Church has allowed divorcees to be remarried in church, influenced by the result of changes in English divorce laws in the late 1960s. Now, women and divorce. So far we have discussed men's right to divorce. However, women can also instigate divorce. They can obtain divorce by mutual consent according to verses 229 through 231, chapter 2, or in case of cruelty, husband's cruelty, abandonment, or harm, or if a husband fails to meet his obligation of providing and maintaining, in, in these latter cases, the woman should apply directly to the court. The husband is responsible to provide during marriage and for a period even after the marriage. He is also responsible to provide for his children. This in itself places some restrictions on his exercising his rights to divorce lightly. 
he will not take divorce lightly without going to court. The delayed dowry payment, which can be a considerable sum, falls due on divorce, meaning when the divorce happens, the dowry is due. In general, it's due on or before divorce, separation. So, and can act as a deterrent here in this case to hasty request for divorce. In any case, a woman can stipulate in the marriage contract her right to divorce her husband at any time without his consent. This is recognized in Islamic law and practiced in certain parts of the Muslim world, but that has to be spelled out in the marriage contract. When discussing fam uh, family life, marriage and divorce, the Qur'an does not simply produce regulations implied in dry legal language. Legal instructions are embedded in religious, emotional language, using a powerful use of linguistic techniques of persuasion and discussions such as those already mentioned, like if you believe in God and know that you are going to meet him, or remember that God is watching over everything and he has full knowledge and full power over you, or that is better and purer for you, um, or he knows and you, all you do not know. Marriage and divorce in Islam are protected by law, by society, and by the strong appeal to the belief in God and the hereafter. In conclusion, family is the first and the most important institution in human life in the sense that its influence is felt at every stage of human life. Moreover, it derives its importance from the fact that it is within the family that human, the most noble of all creatures, according to the Islamic concept of life, is brought up. While the institution of marriage is highly regarded and considered as the cornerstone of the society in Islam, the divorce is permitted as the last resort when it becomes absolutely necessary. In a marriage, the husband and the wife each have their own roles and responsibilities to each other and to God. The biggest factor, catalyst, in a successful marriage is the husband's and wife's obedience to God and believing in the day of accountability. True believing and practicing husband and wife have this big factor in common. We ask Allah to increase our Iman and increase our knowledge about His Deen and help us remove the misconceptions and doubts. We ask Allah to grant us that which is good for us and grant us our grant our single men and women the best believing spouses as He sees fit. We ask Allah to remove any act of selfishness from each and every one of us and bless our marriages and make our marriages successful. We ask Allah to give us full contentment and joy in our spouses and offsprings, the comfort of our eyes, and make us an example to be followed by the pious. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر السلام عليكم